Welcome back. Ask most vets, and they'll probably tell you the treatment that they get at the VA is pretty darn good. The problem isn't the health care, then it's navigating the system. Two years ago, the Secretary of Veterans Affairs promised to make it easier for vets to get disability benefits and fix systematic delays throughout the VA's network of hospitals and clinics. But challenges remain. And joining us now is Brian Jacobs, an Iraq combat vet, Lee Washington of the Manatee Veterans Health Services, and our own consumer watchdog, Jerry Zimmer. Brian, let me start with you because um, you are a veteran, uh, your brother was a veteran, you deal with veterans every day, and we've talked to you before. Over the last few months, uh, over the last year, has the system and the, the transition that veterans are, have to go through once they come back here in order to get into the VA system, is it working any better than it was when we first started talking about this? Well, you know, um, I mean, myself, when I got out of the military, um, it really was about you know, plugging yourself in from the get-go. Um, a lot of the problems is you know, when you get a chance to transition from the military to the civilian world, you've got to start while you're in the military. Um, a lot of guys uh, don't get the same transitional assistance. Um, some guys are coming back from deployment short term um, and have to get out of the military quicker and they're not setting themselves up for success. Um, you know, the biggest thing is really getting with you know, other veteran networks and veteran communities within your local community to help guide you. Um, you know, something great about our community is that every veteran knows a veteran that can help you. And that is really what is making the big transition happen. And it's about having people lead you in the right direction. Lee, this is what you do. This is your day job. Um, and the interesting facet around here is, yes, we have a, a veterans clinic uh, in our area here, but the big facilities are in St. Pete and Tampa, and it makes it is difficult for some vets to get out there for the full range of, of the treatment that they need. Well, transportation definitely can be an issue for some veterans, but in Manatee County as well as Sarasota County, they both have transports that take veterans there every single day for their scheduled appointments. And we're very fortunate to have not only an outpatient clinic here in Bradenton, but as well in Sarasota on Bee Ridge Road, uh, coupled with the vet center that uh, does the readjustment for those combat veterans. Jerry, the, the wait times have been so much in the news uh, over the last couple of years. It was a crisis. It was terrible. Um, from what you have seen, are wait times getting any better? The VA will tell you so. So I think we have to take that at face value. 30 years of dealing with government agencies, I'm a little bit skeptical. It always seems to me that since the VA's founding after its Civil War, the VA has been reactionary. It's never been ahead of the, the curve. And it'd be nice to see uh, the VA knows that the demographics are changing in the terms of the number of veterans. Are they going to be ro relocating? We have a lot of capacity down here now, but as the boomers get older, the boomer veterans, are we going to be able to handle well, all that? Well, what are we seeing? You know, we, we have a new administration in Washington, a new Secretary of Veterans Affairs who was uh, bumped up. Uh, he, coming into this administration, was really respected. Are we seeing those kinds of changes? I think it's a little bit too early to tell. He's only really been on the job for, for five months. And you have budgetary considerations, too. I mean, there's some reports that will say that the VA is robbing Peter to pay Paul. We, you have the Choice Program, which has now been extended. But are they taking those resources from the VA and applying them to Choice Program? We, we just don't know yet. Right. And, and Lee, in terms of, of that, in terms of the resources that you see that are available to our local veterans here, um, you know, these are tight fiscal times in Washington, D.C. What are local vets seeing in terms of the resources available, whether it's locally here or in St. Pete or Tampa? My belief is that locally, and I, and I say locally meaning Bay Pines down the Naples, that's the catchment area in which we live. So that's going to be the main hospital in St. Petersburg, including all the clinics down to the Naples area. In our, in our communities, I think it's really good. I get about 90% of my care through the VA. And although it is uh, quite hard to navigate, my office is tasked with making sure that all the residents of Manatee County are aware of those programs. Okay, we have to just take a quick break. We are just getting warmed up and we'll have much more in veteran health care right after we get a check on the first alert weather. Stay with us. Welcome back. It's not the health care, it's navigating the VA's health care system. And joining us for more is Brian Jacobs, an Iraq combat vet, Lee Washington of the Manatee Veterans Health Services, and our own consumer watchdog, Jerry Zivik. There are a number of areas I want to get to. I want to start with service connection. It's a story um, that I have done for a lot of years, and that is the difficulty that veterans 
sometimes have in terms of proving that their injury, whether it's a physical injury or, or PTSD, is connected to their service in our military. Um, Part of the difficulty, Lee, has been uh, the communication be between the Defense Department and the VA. Over the last few years, have you seen this get any better? In certain circumstances, yes, it has gotten better. Some of the larger commands are taking the time out to make sure that those uh, warriors are being seen prior to discharge. And I truly believe that it's more of an issue for DOD making that communication uh, known to the Veterans Administration. Are, are you still seeing some vets get the runaround for injuries that are frankly apparent? I don't know if I'd actually say runaround, but it's extremely difficult. And unfortunately, when they're discharged, those records now have to reach their way to the VA. And when they don't, the VA is making a decision on something they don't have when it's clear to all of us that this injury resulted from service. And, and Lee, you're dealing with this at yourself. You have a back injury, and I would imagine that's the kind of thing that uh, might be a little bit more difficult to get service connection to. Oh, well, you have to prove it, and then that's the hard part is proving, you know, because, the, you know, it's, you know, I have x-rays, you have MRIs, and they show injuries, and they, and, but you don't go in the military with this pre-existing condition. It's, it's impossible. You wouldn't be able to get into the well, You couldn't serve. Right. Um, and so when you come out and you have this condition, you know, there's a lot of, you know, a lot of work. And luckily you have great VSOs, you know, like Lee Washington, who take time to research and show the, you know, the condition as it's uh, gotten worse. Um, there are some that um, I've heard stories of, you know, because you've gained a lot of weight. That's why your knees are bad. Or should it be the other way looked at? Your knees are bad, so you've gained a lot of weight. Um, so it's really about how the story is told to the VA when the, the injury occurs or how to prove it. Two other areas I want to get into, and, and Jerry, one of them is staffing issues because as we said from the onset, many vets have no issue in terms of the quality of the care that they get at the VA, but there is an issue sometimes in terms of, of uh, you know, the, the how long it takes to get an appointment, based upon staffing level sometimes, and there's a new investigative report out from the VA's IG, right? Yes, there is. But I want to address something Lee said for just a second about the communication between the DOD and the VA. Mm -hmm. that you're 100% correct this would make a difference. And I read a report that in order for them to fix that problem of communication between the two, it would cost $6 billion and take 16 years to correct. I've done that story for the past 16 years. Yeah. so. How could that happen? It's part of this reaction instead of being ahead of the curve. So today a report came out by the investigator general and talked about the fact that there are huge staffing shortages across the country. And so the question is, well, if you're, how can you have good health care if there aren't people to treat you? Maybe you'll get your appointment. Maybe they've got appointment times down. Uh, and, but what are you, what's the follow-up on the appointment? Uh, in terms of they said they're short medical officers, that's the number one thing they're short of. They're short nurses, number two. Psychologists, three. Physician assistants, four. And five is medical technologists. So they're short, te literally, I read somewhere that they're short over 40,000 people across the country. And that's a huge number. Lee, I, you know, I, I see this firsthand. I have friends who work at uh, both the VA in uh, the hospital in Tampa and at Bay Pines, and they are always hiring. I, I would imagine, or raise this as a question, is there are just so many metal tech, uh, uh, medical technologists and nurses and doctors out there to fill these positions. Most definitely, but I also think the training part of it has a part to play because you're talking about a position that may take two years to truly understand what you're doing there. And, you know, unfortunately, you're going to have those opportunities to where a veteran is engaging with the VA, and they just run across very bad customer service, not being told the things that they need to know and other alternatives to getting the help that they need. Is that not improving? It is. I would say in our area, most definitely, because we have a very active community. Nationwide, it'd be hard to say. Uh, as we were speaking during the break, you think about those individuals being discharged, going back to rural America, they really don't have the systems in place to link them to all the services. And that was the other area I wanted to get into because there was also a new report, Jerry, is there not in terms of veteran suicide? That's a different report that came out today. Uh, but what's interesting too, uh, in, in terms of, of health care, they have an uh, and staffing, they have a problem keeping staff. They have huge losses. They're almost at 50-50, the people they bring on board, they're losing people. And if, and if it takes two years to learn the job, 
they're losing probably the best people. To answer your question, today in front of the Committee of Veterans Affairs, the Assistant Attorney General spoke about suicide. And they talked more, it's, ten page, it's a 10 page statement. And they're talking more about data collection than actually w what they're doing. But at the very end, they come to this conclusion, it's all about outreach. And, and Brian agrees with that. And I think Lee agree agrees with that. Brian, this is a, obviously an incredibly personal injury to you because your brother who also served and he committed suicide I, in Georgia, I believe. Yes, sir. And do you believe the fact that he lived in a rural area was partly responsible for the inability or the lack of outreach from the VA? Um, you know, I mean, he, he plugged in the best way he could, and, um, and he was also facing, you know, a transportation issue. Um, you know, like we were discussing earlier, you know, to be in a rural area around Florida, you may have an opportunity to get to a VA clinic and then bus to an appointment. His closest big uh, VA hospital was down in Jacksonville, which was two hours away. His smaller clinic was a regional outreach clinic who uh, just sometimes the clinician staff was not even available. Um, and they wouldn't return phone calls. Um, but it, you know, it was every place that he was, had gone. You know, different care exists. Um, you know, I have I had often wondered if you know he would come to this area, what would have been different? Um, that might be. That's a question that we'll, we'll never be able to answer. But what we do know is that we have large rural areas uh, in Florida, especially if we go to the south and and to the east from here. And uh, I, I know it's out of your territory, Lee. But I mean, do you hear from veterans in areas near here or not so near here that um, you know wish that there were more services available out there for both medical and psychological? issues every day you know you talk talk about the VA it's a three-headed monster It has benefits that are going to compensate a veteran from injuries or pensions you have the health care administration obviously we're talking about that today and of course the National Cemetery Administration but yes we get calls from around the state even around the country asking particular questions and I will say that the state of Florida is doing a great job because the Florida Department of Veteran Affairs once a veteran moves to this area and they get a new license. They are asked, would you like to be contacted by the Florida Department of Veteran Affairs, which then filters down to the community in which they now live. The thing is, in my experience, many veterans would, or some veterans, I should say, would, would answer no to that question. Yes. They, they, they they're not going to, you know, it, it has to be re outreach in a different way. That is correct. They don't always self-identify either, and that's, the, that's another negative. Right. All right. We're going to take a quick break and we'll return for final thoughts in a moment. Our guest joining us right now for final thoughts. Brian, you do amazing work in terms of your organization, uh, in terms of getting vets jobs. You, you are a vet. You see a lot of vets. What is not being done right now that you think is really important to get done? I mean, that's a, I mean, because every veteran's needs are different, and that's, and that's the situation. And how a veteran plugs himself into the system is very important. Um, what we do is we try to answer basically every little need that we possibly can by bringing in veteran service officers, by bringing in the organizations that can support them in the community. Um, I mean, and that's really where it, to me, it, it goes back to is that not all the needs a veteran needs is going to be met by the VA. Uh, some of those things are just, it's impossible. I mean, sometimes a veteran needs someone just to talk to. And, and a job. And a job. And so this is why you put these people in the right places with the, at the right time. You're walking the walk here in the Sarasota area. Thank you. What are you seeing in terms of the availability of jobs for veterans who are coming home now? Well, you know, there's, there's, a, big, um, there's a big issue um, where it comes to, you know, what you did in the military and how it crosses over into the civilian world. Um, a lot of those things are being uh, fixed, um, but that is a very slow process. Um, there are some careers. Um, I know myself, you know, being a combat paramedic, there were situations where I was only qualified to draw blood once I had returned from Iraq, where I was a level three trauma technician. Um, and so you had to basically go back to school to reprove. And there used to be you could challenge test. But those things, uh, they took a flip-flop. And now you're having to get re-educated, retrained. But you know, this is the purpose of the GI Bill and organizations like mine to get, give people education and training and opportunity. Lee, I'm going to ask you the same question in terms of what do we need to do better? I know that the VA is, is, is working hard, hard to fix the problems it did have. The state puts a lot of money into it as well. What are we leaving out? 
Yeah, I would say if we're going to see a true dent in any of the problems that we see, the four of us at this table, as well as your listening audience, uh, we could do so much more than just waiting for the VA to fix itself. So I would say if you know of a veteran, have them reach out to their county representatives as far as our office in Manatee County. Every county in the state of Florida has an office just like ours. And you have to be a wartime veteran in order to do what we do. So we understand it. So those conversations that may be hard for family members to have, we can have it for them. And, and Jerry, we often talk about the fact that money does not, in and of itself, does not fix all problems. But if you listen to some members of Congress, uh, they say that they're still fighting the battle on Capitol Hill of getting the VA adequate funding to fix the, the problems, whether it's uh, amount of, of delays in terms of, of treatment or staffing issues or like that. Where are we right now? Because you know it's a new day in Washington, new administration. Or are they putting their money where their mouths are? Until we actually see a budget, I, I can't say yes or no. I do know that the last statistics say that the VA spent over $57 billion on health care. The VA does incredible work. It's the largest single integrated health care system in the United States. What they have to do, the VA has to settle two issues. They have to look at long-term problems and short-term problems. They need to have a plan. They need to talk about refocusing who are they going to treat veterans veterans family they have over 1400 facilities maybe since the the demographics are going to change where the veterans live maybe they should close some of those facilities open up others enter into private partnerships there's all kind of, but they need a vision. All right, we'll have to leave it there. But before we go, we want to share with you some feedback on our topic last night. Reaction to players, coaches, and NFL owners taking a knee and President Trump's reaction. Some players took a knee during the national anthem. Some teams stayed in the locker room. The protest started about a year ago when Colin Kaepernick kneeled during the national anthem to protest police brutality. But the numbers skyrocketed last weekend after President Trump said, quote, I wouldn't, wouldn't you love to see one of those NFL owners when somebody disrespects our flag to say, get that SOB off the field right now? Well, here's what ha some of you have to say. Leanne says, Trump's crazy rantings led to this whole mess. His desire to get his base back and stir the pot knows no limits. I do not believe the NFL was disrespecting the flag and that their protests were peaceful and just. Much classier than anything that comes out of the White House lately. Sandy says, take a knee as a team before the game, stand arms linked as a team, and salute the flag. Americans both sides win, go teams. But Mike says, why does the media add fuel? You all are most of the problem. Yeah, Mike, if the media just didn't report on what happens, there wouldn't be a problem. Got it. Well, if you'd like to add your voice to the conversation tonight, just visit our Facebook page at facebook.com slash mysuncoast.com dot abc7. And FYI, you can watch past discussions. They're available on demand. They're available on Apple TV, Amazon Fire, and Roku. We want to thank our guests for being here tonight, Brian Jacobs, an Iraq combat vet, Lee Washington of the Manatee Veteran Health Services, and our own consumer watchdog, Jerry Zivik.